This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Welcome to the Three Lions Podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. You join me just as the World Cup is fast approaching. We'll be talking about that later in the show, but we are talking Women's World Cup. That is to be held next year in New Zealand and Australia. Of course, if you want to hear about the Qatar World Cup, I've done plenty about that and still have many more episodes to come. And just to point you towards one of those episodes, it's a recent one where I spoke with Qatari resident and England fan Ben Williams. We went through a few last-minute things that perhaps might come in handy if you are heading off to the Middle East. That can be found at episode 227, uh, either at threelinespodcast.com or your podcast provider of choice. And of course, then there is the World Cup series, one where throughout the year I have spoken with various people who have either played for England, supported England, or written about England's journeys to the World Cups over the years. Once again, threelinespodcast.com or your favourite podcast platform. As I said, this episode... He's about the Lionesses. And once again, I'll be joined by Rich Laverty uh, to talk about the upcoming Japan and Norway games, of which are being played in Spain. I hope to also touch on the recently announced game against Brazil, which is being played at Wembley on the 6th of April next year. It's the European champions against the South American champions. It is the Finalissima. And then, as I say, there is the small matter of the World Cup next year. Now, on the 22nd of October, just gone, in Auckland, England found out who they would be playing against. And we'll get Rich's reaction to that too. But first up, on the 1st of November, Serena Weigman announced her latest squad. This one is to travel to Pinatar in Murcia, southeastern Spain. Uh, there are two friendly games against Japan and Norway. Japan on the 11th of November and Norway on the 15th of November. Now our record against Japan, uh, we've played eight, we've won five, drawn two. We have never lost to the Japanese. Uh, our most recent meeting was the 2020 She Believes Cup tournament. Uh, played out in America, and we won that one by a goal to nil. Versus Norway, played them slightly more times. 23, in fact, of which we've won six, drawn three, and lost 13. Although a lot of those games, a lot of the uh, the lost games, were back in the early 80s and throughout the 80s. But of course, our most recent meeting was in the group stage in the Euros. I'm sure you know this already, but we won that one 8-0. Now Serena's squad for those two games, it's a 25-player squad, is as follows. Goalkeepers Mary Epps, Sandy McKeever and Ellie Roebuck. Defenders Millie Bright. We have Lucy Bronze, who currently is the oldest within the squad and you may remember recently won her 100th cap against the Czech Republic last month. Uh, there's Neve Charles is back in. Rachel Daly is in. Alex Greenwood. Now we have two uncapped players. And the first one is Maya Letizia of Manchester United. Uh, we've got Esme Morgan, Manchester City. Lotta Wuben Moy is in. In midfield, Frank Kirby. Jordan Nobbs returns. She's doing really well for Arsenal of late. Georgia Stanway, uh, who scored a couple of great goals I saw for Bayern Munich recently. Ella Toon, Kira Walsh and Katie Zellum are in. And then up front, Lauren Hemp, Lauren James, 
Chloe Kelly, Beth Mead, Nikita Paris, Alessia Russo, and the other uncapped player is Katie Robinson uh, of Brighton Hove Albion. And finally, Ebony Salmon of the Houston Dash. She'll be hoping to add a few more minutes than she did in the last squad. Now, as I say, it's a 25-player squad. It has an average age of 24.9. It is one with 787 caps across it and 149 goals within it. It features six players from Manchester City and Manchester United, four from Chelsea, three from Arsenal, two from Barcelona, and one each from Aston Villa, Brighton, Bayern Munich, and Houston Dash. Now, obviously, there are a few omissions for a variety of reasons. Uh, Captain Leah Williamson is still out. She missed last month's games against the USA and the Czech Republic. Millie Bright, I'm sure, will likely take the armband. Jess Carter, Demi Stokes and Jess Park, they also miss out. Then there is also the Hannah Hampton situation, which, to be honest, I and many others probably don't really know the full extent of. And we just really go by paper talk and Twitter talk, don't we? Uh, Where, frankly, in the end, it can all just become Chinese whispers. So I think out of respect, we'll leave that one with what Serena Weigman has said, that the door is always open. So when players perform, they have the chance to make the squad. Uh, And then there is Tottenham's Ashley Neville, defender. There was a lot of talk about her deserving a call-up, what with Spurs currently riding high in the WSL. And she's popped up with a few important goals too. Perhaps her time is still to come. We wait and see. And obviously, with another round of WSL games still to come this weekend, there is still the chance of this squad having players pulling out with injury. But that obviously remains to be seen. And of course, that was inevitable. Let me just edit this little bit in. Uh, Fran Kirby pulled out on Friday with a viral infection. So Jess Park, the Everton forward, who is on loan from Manchester City, has been called up again. She was part of last month's squad but remained unused, so maybe she'll get a bit of match time this time around. I'd like to welcome back to the Three Lines podcast, regular on the show, Rich Laverty. Hello, Rich. Morning, mate. How are you? Very well, thank you. You busy? Uh, yeah, it's been busy this week. It, you know what football's like. One week you're, you're out and about every day, and then one week you've got a quiet week, and uh, this week just happens to be the busy one. So, oh. uh... <laughs> well, we won't keep you too long, but obviously we uh, we appreciate your insight. What I was thinking uh, for this one, we'll, we'll look on the uh, the recent squad that Serena's announced, then touch on the, they call it the finalissima, I believe. I always struggle with that one, but it's a game against Brazil next year that they've announced. Uh, and then, of course, the, the World Cup draw has been made. How does that sound? Yeah, I mean, it's it's what we want, isn't it? You know, we've got these constant big games coming up you know that I think I said it on the last podcast we didn't really have that leading up to the Euros with the way the schedule was obviously playing qualifiers at the same time and we were playing sort of you know Luxembourg's and, and Latvia's and, and teams like that obviously we'll have I think the Arnold Clark Cup's coming back obviously of course yeah I, I don't think from what I've heard that it's going to be quite as all glamour ties as it was last year but um, we'll see when that gets confirmed, but it, it's still important games, and there'll be competitive games, and and like you said, with with the World Cup coming up, and yeah, obviously games like Brazil, etc., and and obviously the games this month that we'll talk about. It's it's yeah, it's what you need. Excellent stuff. All right, well, well, let's start with the squad that Serena announced. It's for the games against Japan and Norway to be played in Spain. Uh, I know we spoke last time. You weren't going to go. You haven't changed your mind, have you? No, I, I could go, but I probably wouldn't have a job at Sheffield United when I get back. So, Fair enough, fair enough. Well, uh, it's a squad that um, I've already been through, but it features two 
uncapped players who I thought maybe you could just uh, give us a little bit more insight to. Maya Letizia from Manchester United, a uh, defender, and Casey Robinson, a striker for Brighton and Hove Albion. Yeah, I, I think Maya, I mean, both of them in a way have been sort of knocking on the door. Uh, both of them have been in the under-23s for, for quite some time. And I think Maya was probably the one everybody kind of saw coming um, in terms of her rise. You know, she was very, very good at Brighton. She was always a very good defender. She she obviously worked her way uh, to get to a position where she got moved to Manchester United. And I think as a national team manager, you're always wanting to see how that player sort of deals with that step up. But mm-hmm. obviously going into a, you know, a, no disrespect to Brighton, obviously, but, you know, it's just a whole different world going and playing for a team where, where you're expected to be challenging for trophies and, and obviously to get into Champions League football. And, and she's walked straight in there, gone straight into the team, had a huge impact both offensively and, and defensively. So it doesn't shock me. I, I think Maya, if she keeps the form, it will be one that, that's there to stay um, in terms of the England squad. Katie, Katie's an interesting one. I mean... She's a good little player, you know. She's never massively been a prolific goal scorer, but I think she's a, a decent all-round player. She's quite versatile as a forward. She's had a few loan spells, which which have helped a little bit. And it's tough sometimes. Like it sounds weird, but maybe as a defender, it's it's easier to impress in teams that are you know Brighton obviously are, are struggling a little bit at the moment. And you know, for a forward player, I always look at the forwards at. at Brighton and Reading and Leicester, you know, it's really hard because you, you're sort of feeding off scraps and yeah. Katie's probably in that little bit of a position at the moment, but she she tends to do well when she goes away with England um, at the 23s level. So it's a good opportunity, you know, at the end of the day, and you're sort of seeing there's now one or two players, you know, popping in and out. We saw it with Lucy Parker, obviously, in the last squad. And, and unfortunately, that didn't work out because she got an injury. But, you know, if, if you can take a a player along that, you know, maybe is on that fringe of, of being ready to step in if, if someone gets injured or if someone's unavailable and then maybe go back to the under-23s. We've seen that with Jess Park. You know, she's back in the under-23s on this camp. So it's a good opportunity, you know, for them to go and train up and, and learn more about the environment and, and what the level is. So I think with Katie, it'll be interesting to see how she develops. I think with Maya, I think she's definitely one that I think is there to there to stay. I did read actually just regarding Mel Letizia. She is of no relation um, to Matt no. Letizia. No, they're from the same same part of the world, same island. But no, they <laughs> apparently there's two separate Letizia uh, families in in Guernsey. So uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a small world, but apparently not quite that small. Yeah, oh, there you go. Just touching on the the under twenty threes, the the men's side don't have an under twenty threes squad. The women's side, they obviously feel it's a uh, a profitable sort of team to have because we're often talking of these players just sort of gradually making the move up through the uh, the ranks and then to the under twenty threes and then to the the senior squad. So it's, it's obviously a highly thought of team. I think it's important in terms of well, the reality is there'll be a lot of players in that squad that don't go on and play for for the senior team, but it bridges a gap and and the twenty threes we, we for one reason or another I'm not really sure why we got rid of it for a few years and you know our next age group under that is is under 19s we don't have you know an under 20s we don't have an under 21 so you know if you come out of the under 19s it's a huge gap to then go and and step up to you know the first team and if you're not ready you're not getting any international football so I think they've created it essentially to keep players that are now between that 19s 20 and and the first team just just keep them active in international football keep them on camps, you know, some of them can go and train up. They're always around St. George's Park. I'm sure Serena, the coaching staff, will go and watch them and and monitor how they're doing. So, And obviously, if you need players at short notice, you can just pick them out because they're on camp anyway. So I think it's just a sensible thing to have. You know, like I said, a lot of players probably won't go and end up playing for the senior team, but it's keeping them involved in international football, which is important. And um, yeah, I, I think it's a... It's a no-lose situation and obviously you've got Mo Marley in there who's massively experienced and has developed basically every single player that is in that England squad um, through the youth team. So, yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, whether, even if it only produces one player for the senior squad, I think it's it's worthwhile having. Absolutely. 
Well, Japan and Norway are the, the two opponents. England under Serena are yet to lose. Do we see that changing? Uh, I, I don't think so in, in the context of these two games. I think, I mean, I, I, Japan Japan are interesting. I said this on the last one, I think. Yeah. They're, they're such a technical team. I don't think they're at the level they were. I think European teams are starting to go past them now, but they are just, you know, they're a very technically gifted side. Norway, obviously still in a bit of a transition under a new head coach, obviously a, a head coach that's pretty familiar to, to England. And yeah, I mean, uh, they've had a little tricky start, and but I'm sure they're going to want to put some things right. But, you know, they, they've not got Ada Hegerberg, who, who's injured. They've not got Carolina Graham Hansen, who's injured. So, but you know, they, they're friendlies for a reason at the end of the day. You know, they're good tests. It'll be a test for Norway. It'll be a test for Japan. And it'll be a test for England. Well, anything can happen, but I, I don't see this being the camp where, where that run ends at the moment. We shall wait and see. Well, you mentioned the uh, the Arnold Clark Cup, which, to be honest, I'd forgotten about, but that's still yet to be announced. But the next game actually scheduled is a game for the 6th of April next year. As I say, it's the, the Finalissima. Basically, it's it's a glorified friendly with a trophy. It's the uh, the European champions against the South American equivalent, Copper America winners. Being played at Wembley, it is England against Brazil. This this is a big game, albeit a friendly, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's what you want. You know, you, you want big games, you want big occasions as well. You know, it's at Wembley. It, it will probably sell out. You know, I think every England game. I think I said this again last time. Every England game probably will sell out now, especially when you're playing at Wembley against a team that, you know, has got some big, big name players and, and some great players. It'll be a great match and, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of all for it really. It's all, it, it's almost always a bit gimmicky, you know, these things when you suddenly just suddenly decide out of thin air, okay, the European champions are going to play the South American champions, I'm going to do it every year or, or every couple of years or whatever, but I'm all for it, you know, I think it's it's good. Um, England are a great team. Brazil are a great team. They've got a great coach in, in Pierre Sundaga. And it, it's another test at the end of the day. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, ahead of the World Cup. You might have to play a team like Brazil, you know, to win a World Cup. So it is a friendly, but, you know, it's it's Wembley. It's another opportunity to showcase the women's game. It's a test for, for Serena. It's a test for Pierre. It's a test for the players. And so I think all around it, it sort of ticks every box for, for everybody involved. And, um, yeah, I, I hope it's there to stay, to be honest. Yeah, we shall, we shall wait and see. Yeah, it's, it's, it looks like a, a good game. It's one I've got a ticket for already. But let's let's move on to the World Cup. Last month, the draw was made to find out who England's opponents would be. And just in as in 2019, we've been drawn in Group D. We have been drawn against China... Denmark, and one of Chile, Haiti, or Senegal. We're in the bottom half of the group, which means we're going to play all our games in Australia. And just looking at the draw, if we were to finish top or second in the group, we'll play the runners-up of either Group B, which is one of Australia, Republic of Ireland, Nigeria, or Canada, which I'm guessing is either going to be against Australia or Canada, but Funny things can happen in the World Cup. So, Group D, uh, Denmark, China, and any of those playoff winners. How how does that sound? Yeah, it's a good group. I think you know the the the, the pot one teams that they should be looking to to advance. I think England were probably fairly fortunate in what they got from from pot two. I think pot two is always the one you look at and go, okay, that could be the one that stops us winning this group. Obviously, because you had. Teams like Canada in there. You had teams like the Netherlands in there. Um, China, again, a good team. Again, similar to Japan. They're very technical. They've, they've got some... They've got a couple of standout players, but I don't think it's going to be one that will massively worry England if they're on it. I think Denmark was a bit of a curveball because they were the top-ranked team in, in pot three. And, you know, again, we know with, with people like Penile Harder, they've got some world-class players, but... I think the group stage draw probably went as well for England as it could. And, and obviously from pot four, you've got a qualifier. So, but I think beyond that, you know, that I mean, to win the World Cup, and it's going to be the same for everybody. I haven't mapped out every single nation's individual paths. Obviously, I've looked at England. And, and like you say, you know, whether you win the group or not, you're looking at 
you know, possibly a, a really tough Canada team, like one of the few teams that England haven't beaten under Serena Wiegmann. And, and Australia, who, I don't know, Australia are an interesting one at the moment, but obviously they have that, you know, home advantage that we keep banging on about that worked for England and worked for the Netherlands. So, you know, it won't be easy. And then I think you're looking at probably Germany in the quarterfinals. And, you know, that's a repeat of obviously the the final from the Euros. And you don't want you don't want to play a team like Germany as soon as the quarterfinals and I think it's France or Brazil or something like that in the semi-finals. So you've got to go through all that just to get to a final. So whoever wins this tournament, you know, and I think I said this in the summer with the Euros, whoever wins it, you're really going to have deserved it because you're going to have to play some incredibly tough matches. You know, you're going to have to get through four really difficult knockout matches to win this tournament. Um, so I think the group stage draw was relatively kind you wanted to avoid a Canada or a Netherlands or someone like that but after that it's going to be really really tough but you know England are there or thereabouts you know we can say now that they're proven winners they've got that experience and you know I'm sure Germany will have a chance France Brazil the US obviously you know Canada um, Spain pending on obviously maybe what happens with Spain over the next six to seven months but you know, it's it's going to be ultra competitive, and and that's great because it shows that you know when we, I don't think it's the case anymore where maybe in the last World Cup or two we've turned up and sort of thought, yeah, the US will probably win it, you know, and if anybody else wins it, it's a bit of a surprise. I think now, you know, the US have got a chance. I think they've got some really fantastic young players coming through, but I think it's going to be wide open. Um, and you know, you look at the path to the final, and and that probably says it all. To be honest. Well, just you mentioned the US there and, and just some of the other group games. Group E is the one that features the States. Uh, they're in with Vietnam and, and like ourselves, have got one of the playoff winners, be it Cameroon, Thailand and Portugal. But also in there are the Netherlands, who was the uh, the, the finals 2019, where where America won that 2-0, which is a, a, an interesting group. Yeah, and, and like I said, you know, with the groups that the way they are, you are going to get some really great groups, you know, and to have teams like the Netherlands who were in the last World Cup final and, and won the Euros five years ago as a pot two team says it all to have Brazil as a pot two team, you know, Norway, uh, Canada, you know, Canada, the Olympic champions, you know, just over a year ago and, and they're a pot two side. So obviously it's tainted a little bit with the fact you've got two host nations going into pot one. I mean, Australia, may have had a chance anyway, New Zealand wouldn't have had. So that's knocked one or two down. But, I mean, it, it's great. Like, you look at the games, and, and I said it again in the Euros, I think you had that week where we had England v Norway, Spain v Germany, you know, uh, France v Italy, Netherlands v Sweden. And you're saying, this is this is a group stage. Like, it's going to be the same where you have the US playing the Netherlands. You have, I think you have France playing Brazil. You have Canada playing Australia and these are games that could be semi-finals, quarter-finals. So, yeah, it's it's, it's great. Like I'm, I've watched World Cups before, and I remember, I think in 2015, watching Switzerland beat Ecuador 10-0 or something like that. And, you know, the last World Cup, obviously, US, you know, absolutely hammered Thailand. And you might get a result like that or two, especially with it being expanded and some teams coming in that have never been at a major tournament before. But... I think at the very top end, it's going to be as competitive as ever. And, you know, now you look at the group stages and and you used to maybe look at it and think, yeah, let's just get the group stage out of the way and then the big games rock up, you know, once we get past that. But now you're going to have some massive games in the groups and, yeah, just bring, you know, the, everything we just talked about, you know, um, you know, the games this month, the the Anna Clark Cup, um, the Copa Fenelissima, you know, other warm-up friendlies, I'm sure, next year. And, and then the World Cup itself, like, it's just a, it's an endless stream of you know massive games and and at the end of the day that's what we've we've been working for 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 many years in women's football so yeah bring it on yeah no it's a, it's a great time for for the women's game at the moment rich thank you very much as always for joining us i know you're very busy as likewise with the the football world it is going to get very busy we'll uh, we'll see if we can have a chat post the uh, the japan norway games but we'll we'll see how we all are if that's all right No problem, mate. Thanks as ever. Thank you, as always, to Rich for his time there. Of course, you can follow him on Twitter 
at Rich J Laverty. Now, of course, we spoke about the World Cup there. Just want to clarify about our group and that last space that is yet to be filled. So we will find out our opponents once the final playoff game has been played. Uh, The 18th of February sees Haiti play Senegal in Auckland. Then the winners face Chile, who have already qualified, on the 22nd of February, again in Auckland. Chile, they got to the final as they finished fifth in the in this year's Copa America, which was their pathway to the World Cup playoff final, if that makes sense. So we will play either Chile, Haiti or Senegal on the 22nd of July next year, of which we have never played any of those before. So that'll be interesting. Then on the 28th of July, we played Denmark. Uh, Going back in history, we've played them 17 times. We've won eight, drawn three and lost six. Most recent game was a 2019 friendly at Walsall, where we won 2-0. And then on the 1st of August next year, 2023, our game against China. Now, our record against China, we've played five, we've won one, drawn one, we have lost three. And most recently, there was a 2015 friendly in China. That was in the, let me pronounce this right, Duel Ibon Cup, which was a small international friendly tournament held in Yongchang in China, and that also featured Australia. Of course, once the World Cup comes around next year, we will focus more on the Lionesses and and what the World Cup entails. But I thought, actually, just let's go through all of the, uh, the World Cup groups, eight of them, 32 teams, and we'll start, as we should do, Group A features New Zealand, Norway, the Philippines and Switzerland. I don't know how good the Philippines are, to be honest. Um, I could imagine them coming bottom. Uh, It might be between Switzerland and Norway to try and go through that one. Group B, uh, we mentioned that he will be in the round of 16. Whoever wins or comes second here will play England, hopefully. Uh, That features Australia, the Republic of Ireland, Nigeria and Canada. And as I say, I think that will be Australia and Canada coming through that one. Group C, Spain, Costa Rica, Zambia and Japan. Once again, I I don't know know anything about Zambia's football, full stop, be it the men's or the women's. Um, Costa Rica men, obviously done fairly well. Um, but I don't know much about their their women's side. I'm going to say it's Spain and Japan going through that one. Uh, group D is our group, ourselves, Denmark, China, and one of Chile, Haiti, Senegal. Obviously, I can see us going through there. Uh, with who? Oh, I don't know. Group E, that's the one we said about that features the USA and the Netherlands. Uh, alongside them is Vietnam and the playoff winners of between Cameroon, Thailand and Portugal. Not quite sure how that one will go. You'd expect the USA to go through that one, uh, but potentially the Netherlands and Portugal fighting it out for second place. Don't know. Group F, France, Jamaica, Brazil... And then there is the final Group C playoff winner. Now, this one features four teams. Chinese Taipei play Paraguay and Papua New Guinea play Panama. Then the winners of each play each other to fill that last Group C playoff uh, to go into Group F. Uh, So alongside France, Jamaica, Brazil. I'm just going on what I know about sort of football in heritage you'd expect France and Brazil to go through that one group G I would predict this as being the group of death Sweden South Africa Italy and Argentina 
not quite sure who would go through on that one. It could be any one of them. And then Group H, Germany, Morocco, Colombia and Korea. You'd expect Germany to go through there. But again, I don't know anything about Morocco. I don't know anything about Colombia's women. I don't know anything about Korea's women. Um, yeah, I, I really don't know. It's, it's all going to be a learning curve for not just me, but for all of us, I think. Now, also, we mentioned about the Arnold Clark Cup, of which, of course, we are the holders. Since Rich and I spoke, the full lineup has now been announced for the February tournament. The Lionesses, they were going to be joined by South Korea, Belgium and Italy. Unsure the venues as yet, but much like the Brazil game, I'm sure we'll talk about those nearer the time. Now, one final thing before I leave you. You may have seen the announcement of a Nations League finals for the women's game. This has been in the men's senior game since September 2018 and has been a great success. It means less friendlies and more competitive games against other teams of a similar standard. I think this is a great idea (laughs) and one of UEFA's better ones. We'll not get away from playing the likes of Latvia, North Macedonia and Luxembourg as we'll always have to play a lesser team as such in the European or World Cup qualifying. But what it does mean is that whilst the Lionesses will be playing more games against the calibre of Germany, Spain, France, etc., those smaller teams that I mentioned will be playing each other on a more level playing field and hopefully, in turn, be able to push their own standards up. So in time, hopefully, we won't be seeing 20-0, 10-0 scorelines on such a regular basis. It appears it's going to be introduced as of autumn next year, 2023, in the lead up to the next European Championships, which are being held in 2025. We'll talk about that in due course. But as I said, I think this is a very productive move. So well done, UEFA. Well done. So don't forget those two games against Japan and Norway can be seen on ITV4 on Friday the 11th and Tuesday the 15th of November. And speaking of ITV, I'm not normally one to be watching or talking about reality TV, but how can you not want Jill Scott to win? I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Do you see her taking a step off of that building and then letting go? (laughs) And then the hammock moment. (laughs) I, I think, like a lot of the country... We're just waiting for Matt Hancock to arrive and what not just Jill will say to him, but everyone else. Uh, But vote Jill. Why not? Uh, Oh, and one more thing. Sorry to keep you, but I think this is an important thing to mention. The 18th of this month, November, is an important day in the Lionesses history or more England women as it is the 50th anniversary of their very first official game. And I have a special episode to release all about it. I really hope you'll enjoy this one. I've put a fair bit of effort into it, and air miles, and spoken to some of the people that were involved in that game. I really think this is something that should be celebrated. So please stay subscribed, and you won't miss it. Right. That is all from me. As always, thank you very much for listening. If you are heading out to Spain for those two games, safe journey to you. Enjoy it. And I hope to speak with you very soon. Cheers. Cheers.